type in their questions. Okay, so welcome back to another Facebook Live. I'm Dr. Guy Cappuccino, plastic surgeon, and today we are talking about breast augmentation. This is going to be a slightly longer talk. I'm going to move rather quickly through all of this material just to get through all of it. And anybody who has any questions can just jump in and ask, but let us begin at the beginning. So an overview of what we're going to be discussing today will be augmentation options for the breast, implant choices. I'm going to have some sample patient photos to show different surgical cases and explain a few details. Then we're going to talk about the surgical options themselves, the procedure and the recovery, frequently asked questions, and possible complications. So when it comes to augmentation or enhancing and adding volume to the breast, there are really only two common options for cosmetic applications, and that would be a breast implant or, as you see in the photograph in the syringes, transferring fat. And that is gaining popularity. Our last Facebook Live talked exclusively about fat transfer options, so please refer back to that video or to our YouTube channel uh, to see more details on fat grafting. But today we're going to focus mainly on breast implants and that surgical procedure. If we were talking about reconstructive options, then there would be tissue-based augmentation options, but for cosmetic applications, we're going to mainly focus today on implants. So let's talk about implant choices. There are currently um, three major types of implants. There are some other uh, lesser used implants, but I'm going to stick to the major implants out there today. And those would be um, a round silicone gel implant. So you see that top one there, and I'm holding one in my hand here. So this is a round silicone gel implant. You can see it's very squishy and squeezy and soft and feels very natural uh, and also very resistant to deformation, which is important. And then below that, you'll see a shaped silicone gel implant. So this is a shaped implant. You can see as I'm holding it, it's holding a teardrop shape. Also silicone, also soft and squeezy. And then finally in the bottom, you'll see a saline felt implant. Uh, this is actually a sizer, um, an expander, not a sizer, but you can see that it's just a silicone shell that has not yet been inflated, and we would put saline in that to fill it up. All right, so let's move on. The implants, as you saw me hold up, can be either smooth or rough textured. There are some advantages and disadvantages to each type, and in consultation we would talk more specifically about those differences. And then implants can be different profiles. So profile, as opposed to volume, um, is basically the width of the implants compared to its height. So a very wide but low height implant would be called um, a moderate or low profile implant. And then if this was a narrower but more projected implant, we would consider that to be a higher profile implant. And that's sort of my job in accordance with what the patient desires to choose an appropriately shape, profile, and size implant. Implants can have various levels of what we call cohesivity or how um, elastic and um, how much the gel holds together. In practice, this will manifest as how firm the implant feels. And there are three typical levels. Um, there's level one, which is pretty soft. Uh, this is um, holding a level one implant. So you can see it holds a little bit of a teardrop shape. It's very soft. Level two, uh, it, we're looking right now at um, Allergan's catalog, although I don't uh, necessarily recommend one implant over the other. Um, they have a, a softer, a slightly firmer and in a very firm implant. Most people fit in the first two, one of the two softer ones. So let's go over some uh, sample photos of patients of mine and I can just kind of um, use some examples to show you a few different um, things here. So this is a younger patient in her 20s. Um, she has not yet had children and so she doesn't have any loss of volume following childbearing, but rather she just has a lack of um, the amount of volume that she wants. And so what you're gonna see here is uh, two relatively symmetrical breasts 
and often people will ask me about uh, cleavage, which we'll talk about later. And as you can see, the implants fill out the breast envelope and make the breasts appear closer to one another. Um, but really, we don't have a lot of control over that. How wide apart the breasts are really um, is a question of patient's anatomy. Let's contrast this one with um, this next patient who uh, is an older than her 20s, and she has had children and has a little bit of loose skin and a little bit of loss of volume. But overall, good shape. Uh, there's no reason for a lift. Uh, the breasts are set apart slightly wider than the last patient, approximately two centimeters. Still well within the range of normal, and when we put implants in, we'll have a more natural, slightly teardrop-shaped uh, breast, and the volume is really dependent upon our, our discussion preoperatively. Uh, another example of someone who is thinner and has a little bit of extra skin, uh, starting to get a little bit of sagging in the breast tissue, especially on that right side, but doesn't yet need a lift. Um, as you can see here, I wrote three months after uh, 450 cc silicone implants. Um, the size, the volume isn't critical to the size. We'll talk about that later, but it just is a data point for you. But what I want you to notice here is naturally her breasts are very wide set compared to the other two patients. So although they will appear fuller and uh, closer together, in actuality, the width hasn't really changed. And one more example of someone who's even thinner yet and has a little bit more excess breast skin, but has lost volume after breastfeeding and is a very thin person. And um, the same size roughly implant in this patient, 345 cc's, yields a very natural teardrop shape to her chest. And the implants are um, two to three centimeters apart in terms of interior mammary distance. We can look at different angles here. The three quarter view will show a slightly sloped upper pole, so it doesn't look overly projected or fake. Um, the lateral aspect of the breast is also nicely rounded and um, nipple projection is right in the middle of the breast, so she didn't have a surgical lift, but the implants did sort of lift the implant, uh, or the chest rather, uh, the breast off the chest. And from the side view, um, again, you can see a much more youthful, rounded, projected breast after the implant. Finally, we're gonna look at somebody who did need a, a breast lift. Um, also a patient in her 30s after having children, um, but she just didn't have good shape. And by that, I mean that the nipple was below the native inframammary fold, that fold below her breast. So at one year, um, here we are with implants, but also a lift. Now look at how close together her breasts are set. Uh, they're almost touching, um, but that's again out of my control. It's just where the breasts sit on the chest wall. If we look from the side view, we'll see the, na the native fold is here, and that nipple complex was pretty low um, compared to where it is afterwards in a more youthful appearing breast. I'm just going to take a moment to shut my door because I hear some noise in the hallway, and we're going to move on to our next chapter. And if anybody has any questions um, at any point, please just let me know and I will answer them. Now, when it comes to surgical options, there are some main topics that we discuss in a consultation. I'm going to highlight them here. One question that comes up quite often is where do the implants go relative to the chest wall musculature? And the chest wall musculature is represented in this picture here. So what we see here on the left is a subglandular implant or below the breast gland, but on top of the chest wall muscle. On the right side, we see a submuscular implant, which is under both the breast gland and under the muscle. There are advantages to both, um, and I actually do a variation of um, the submuscular called a partial submuscular, and we will discuss that in consultation to see which is best for the individual patient. This is just another uh, artist rendition of what an implant looks like when it's under the muscle, and you can see um, on this right breast diagram, there is a implant sitting under the muscle, and on the left side, um, there is a implant sitting on top of the muscle. The incision choices could be underneath the breast or under the nipple. And to deliver the implant, I use a device called a funnel, which I'm going to show you here. This is a funnel. 
and it allows me to slide the implant into the breast pocket. Well, it's not going to let me play this, of course, because you know how um, you know how it goes with video. But at any rate, we take the implant and we insert it into this bag, and then we would squeeze it out into a very small incision and in doing so deliver the implant in a very sterile and a traumatic way. Moving on to the next section which we're going to talk about procedural uh, items and recovery. So preoperatively pretty easy. Uh, first thing I always tell patients no smoking. You can't smoke around elective surgery. Uh, really I'd say a few weeks before and six weeks after because it will interfere with the healing process and increase complications and there's just no reason to do that with an elective surgery. If we're over 40 or have a family history of breast disease, we would want to get a mammogram, routine lab work, and then I follow something called the ERAS protocol, Enhanced Recovery After Surgery, and this starts preoperatively with a discussion about expectations and how we're going to manage uh, the surgery, the pain, and the post-operative healing. We'll have you fill prescriptions, a one-time dose of gabapentin, Celebrex and Tylenol, and then we'll go to the day of the procedure. Uh, outpatient surgery, this takes about an hour, uh, give or take 10 minutes. And so preoperatively, we'll do our markings, we'll review the plan and the photos we have. It's general anesthesia, but often um, patients are not intubated. Um, they're just going to be asleep uh, during the whole procedure. And then in addition to that anesthetic, I use nerve blocks. So I'm going to relax the muscle and numb the entire chest wall under ultrasound guidance, which helps not only with post-operative pain, but also intraoperative pain, which will decrease your anesthetic requirements and make for a very smooth wake up. Intraoperatively, I will often use implant sizers. So if we're uncertain of the exact size of the implant that we want, I'll put a sterile reusable sizer in and see how that looks. And if we like the look, we know the exact size. And if we think we have to go larger or smaller, that gives us the option without opening an implant. Once we place the implant, I'll use dissolving stitches to close the incision, and I don't use any drainage tubes, and recovery will be anywhere between half an hour and 45 minutes typically, and then you go home. After surgery, you should expect swelling. Um, that's the thing. So if you want your implant to look like this, after surgery, it's gonna look like this because it's gonna swell and it's gonna swell up. So people often feel like their implants look too high and too large, and this is okay, it will go down. Um, but just, we want you to expect that so you're not surprised. And it's okay to shower the next day in 24 hours. We're gonna give you a surgical bra to wear, although you can wear your own. And I don't expect patients to take any narcotic medication after breast augmentation surgery. It's okay to use your arms. I want you to move around. I don't want you to get stiff. I don't want you to feel like you can't move, but no heavy lifting. And all these instructions are explained in great detail and written out for you. Most people return to work one to three days after surgery. And I let people do some light aerobics within two to three weeks. I want you to get your heart rate up, feel good, um, get the lymphatics pumping and draining, um, but I don't let you do any full chest exercises or strenuous lifting for six weeks. And we'll again discuss that in greater detail. So for some frequently asked questions that people will present me with. Number one, what size will I be? Well, this is a good question and a fair question but not very straightforward to answer. Often patients will tell me they don't even know what bra size or cup they wear, or if they do, they feel it doesn't fit appropriately. And there's no real consensus in standard uh, in the manufacturers that I've seen with bras. So although it's helpful to say, you know, I'm an A, I wanna be a B, or I'm a B, I wanna be a D, um, we'll use it as a jumping off point. More importantly, we're going to select an implant, not only based on your preferences, but also your anatomy to make sure that we have one that fits safely and looks appropriate. And cup size is not directly correlated with breast implant volume because everybody comes with a different amount of native tissue and the way that their skin expands and the size of their frame. It's not a direct correlation. However, I do encourage people to bring me photos, show me photos of models um, of breasts that they like the look of, and then I can help to fit them into a sizer. So we have sizers that we use in the office that we'll put into a sports bra and they can sort of try on a look of a different size um, and get a sense of what that looks like. So that's, that's the way we do that. And um, usually we can get pretty close to that, but 
As with everything, there's no guarantee we'll hit exactly what you envision, but we usually do a pretty good job of getting close. Do I need a breast lift? Well, maybe. And during the exam, I'll determine if you need a lift along with implants. As I showed you that patient before, often that just has to do with the position of the breast tissue and the nipple relative to the crease under the breast. Uh, if you know that ahead of time, we just have that conversation at the beginning. If you're not sure, I'll examine you and let you know if you need one. What if your breasts are uneven? Well, you're not alone. Almost everyone's breasts are uneven. Nipples don't point exactly in the same direction. There's different size of one versus the other. And that's okay. We can account for some of that if we're just doing an implant. Um, sometimes we'll use a slightly different size implant on one side versus the next. And if we're doing a lift, we have much more control over size and shape of each implant. What about cleavage? Well, we discussed this earlier. Really, it's not about how close I place the implants together but more about where the breast sits to begin with. If I were to force these implants closer together unnaturally to create more cleavage, what would happen to that nipple, which should be in the middle, as I move that implant closer to the middle of the chest, that nipple's gonna to wanna to point more out to the side and it can look very strange. So we wanna respect the native anatomy and work with it and enhance it as best we can, but we never wanna do anything unnatural do we need to get them changed every 10 years? I hear this one on almost every consultation. The origin of this thought is uncertain. Uh, it's possibly because older implants carried a 10 year warranty uh, and they felt that outside of 10 years, something bad would happen, they would rupture and it was better to just get them changed prophylactically. That's not the recommendation today. People are very relieved to hear that. People will often ask, can I get gummy bear implants? And this, the answer is yes, you can and you will if you get silicone gel implants. But uh, gummy bear implants refers to a cohesive silicone gel implant that holds its shape. They're all cohesive today. None of them are runny, gooey, liquidy type silicones that existed um, implant generations ago. Some are firmer than others or more cohesive, but really they're all cohesive gel implants. Can I still get a mammogram? Yes, and please do. Do not put off your mammogram. Again, as I said, if you're uh, 40 years old, you gotta get one. If you are, uh, if you have family history, we'll do it at 35. Um, however, um, you certainly should get that implant uh, or that breast evaluated radiographically. The implant will not rupture if you squeeze it with a mammogram. Look, you're not gonna hurt this implant, okay? There's a small risk that the breast might not be completely visualized depending upon the implant placement and your breast tissue. However, um, the radiographers are very good at evaluating it. And if they need to do an ultrasound to see all the breasts in three dimensions, they will. So that's sort of the common FAQ. Now, last but not least, just potential complications. So I've divided this into two slides, general, implant complications, and what I mean by general are things that are common to most breast surgeries. So things like pain, typical bleeding, infection, swelling, scarring, all those things can happen. They're not common, but they can happen. Swelling is common, we expect that, but the other ones, they're not typically seen. A hematoma, which is a collection of blood under the skin, or a seroma, a collection of fluid. Asymmetry, well, if you had asymmetry to start with, we're probably gonna have some afterwards. Nipple sensation changes, which can be um, temporary, they're often temporary, it can be more or less sensitive for a while, and as the nerves heal and the swelling goes down, that typically comes back to normal. And then the inability to breastfeed, which I have not seen in my practice, but has been reported, and the need for more surgery, of course. And finally, um, specific breast implant potential complications. Now, there is an entire packet created by the FDA, which we have here in the office. It's eight pages, I have it laminated and we do go through it page by page during the consultation process, but they highlight some of the specific uh, potential problems. I will just touch on them here, some of the highlights. So the first one, BIA-ALCL, um, this is a lymphoma that's associated with breast implants. 99.9% .9 of the time it is a textured implant, and most of those offending implants have been removed from the market. Uh, since I don't really use textured implants, I haven't seen a case of this in my career, and it's still pretty rare. It's uh, anywhere between one in 3,000 and one in 30,000. Um, and it would present as a, a painful, firm implant. So that's something we want to look out for, but uh, very rare. 
Systemic symptoms, currently the, the hot uh, name for this is breast implant illness. And this is the concept that the very presence of the breast implants causes a number of unrelated um, symptoms that are difficult to uh, determine based upon blood work or radiography, uh, things like muscle uh, pain, fatigue, appetite changes, weakness, brain fog, there's a number of things. The veracity of the breast implant illness claims is up for debate. Um, there are some people that believe it's not real at all. There are other people that believe it's completely a breast implant related phenomenon. Um, I don't say all or nothing on this. Uh, I will discuss what I know about it with the patient during consultation and then make sure the patient is comfortable making their own decision based on the data that we currently have, which we have numbers for. Uh, finally, implant rupture, which is pretty rare also, but when it does rupture, oh, I thought I had it with me. Um, you saw a picture of that implant before. Uh, it's not a sticky, ooey, goozy liquid substance. It's a more cohesive gel that sometimes you can't even tell has ruptured. So the only way we would know is if you got an MRI, um, which I suppose is a good thing that um, implants can rupture and you don't even know it because the gel is so cohesive. And then finally, implant rippling, which would be if you could feel the implant under your skin, typically a problem with very thin people, often with underfilled saline implants. Implant visibility should never be an issue. If your skin is that thin, uh, then we would have a conversation about whether implants are correct for you at all. And then implants could shift uh, over time uh, due to lack of strength of the tissue and the weight of the implant. And we would talk about that and what we would do to correct it. So that is a complete overview of breast implants, a very high level overview that we did in under 30 minutes. If anybody has any questions before I sign off, I'm happy to answer them. I know we don't have too many people on right now. It is four o'clock on a Monday, um, but I'm sure people will go on later and watch this and they can certainly uh, type in questions and I will do my best to get back to you and answer them. So uh, as always, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you learned something and we'll see you next time.